Ah, thank you, Lord, for just a glorious morning already. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all together, Lord, as one church, your church, and of course, represented here in Burbank in this local body of Calvary Bible. Lord, we pray for each and every church out there that is a a God-honoring, Bible-believing church that, Lord, you would receive much glory throughout the world even today. And Lord, now we pray that you will help us to understand and, and to know your scriptures, what they say, how to apply them, that Lord, we will grow because of them, that we will be drawn ever closer in our relationship with you and your son and your spirit. And so Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to see and hear and understand. And we pray this all in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. There are some things in life that require a certain ordering, right? You have to kind of go through a process, point A to B to C to D, that, that kind of thing. Sometimes in the building of a product or, or just to um, bring about a desired result of something, there has to be a certain process, a certain order of events. You might imagine the assembling of an automobile. I remember going as a boy to uh, the GM plant in uh, the Bay Area for, I think, Cub Scouts. And, you know, they take you around and you're you're seeing this cool assembly line and, and robots and things doing all of this this uh, work, but it's, it's extremely important that they, that they go in a certain order. And of course, they start with the bottom part of the car, the frame, the chassis. And while that gets going on, on one uh, assembly route, then they start an, um, an, a different line, which is the body of the car. And the body of the car is going down its assembly line and needs to be put together, they, they put the body together, they give it a thorough inspection, and then the body is painted, and then the next step in the process is the interior. Everything including the instrumentation to wiring systems, dash panels, interior, lights, seats, decor, um, headliners, radio speakers, all the glass except the windshield, they hold on to that. They get the steering column in place, the wheel, the body, weather strips, vinyl tops, brake, gas pedals, carpeting, front and rear bumpers. Then the windshield goes in, followed by the trim and seats. Then it's put through a water inspection, make sure everything seals up nice. Then they do this deal that they call the mating, the mating, which has the body being then placed onto the chassis and bolted to the frame. Then you have final trim, things like battery, tires, antifreeze, and of course, gasoline, so they can get that car off the assembly line. And it's important, needless to say, that that these happen in a certain order in very specific steps, because if it doesn't, well, then the thing's going to come out looking like, you know, I don't know, a gremlin or or the Tesla Cybertruck, some horrible looking whatever, you know, kind of deal. I remember once, uh, and I shared a, a, a story last October about putting together my son Jack's crib. That was the worst experience of putting something together in my life. And, you know, it, the, the instructions were like a generation of a generation of a generation of a generation. So you could barely read them, right? But I missed one step. I did. And I get to almost the end, and I realize I, 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 this isn't going to work. And I, I missed a step, and, well, it's your baby, so you go, oh, i got to do this right, you know? So, so I literally had to back up, and it was way at the beginning where that step was, take everything apart, get that step completed, so that, boom, we had a finished crib, and he wasn't going to climb over it and fall out onto his head and that kind of stuff. So it's important at times to have a certain ordering of things. What, what does this all have to do with our message this morning? Well, two words, ordo salutis, ordo salutis, order of salvation, order of salvation. Now, I, I knew that I wanted to include the gospel in this salvation and sovereignty of God study that we have been going through, but in what sense? And as I'm putting this together, 
that, that thought crossed my mind, and maybe it's crossed your mind too as we've been going through these things. Is there an order of salvation? Is there a process? Is there a step-by-step kind of deal that brings somebody to salvation? How does that, how does that work? And, and yes, different religious groups um, and individuals have thought the same thing, and they've tried to come up with what they think happens and in what order for someone to be saved. The Roman Catholic Church is one, and they've kind of come up with their uh, ordo salutis. Uh, Lutheran theology has done the same. Arminian theology, covenant reform theology has. Even us evangelicals in the, the dispensational, but maybe broadly reformed tradition have come up with an ordo salutis. Paul, Paul lays out a, a broad plan of this in Romans 8, 28 to 30, where he mentions things like foreknowledge, and predestination, and being called, and justified, and glorified. And there's many places throughout Scripture where we see little hints of this, where we'll see two or three aspects of salvation kind of linked together that we think, oh, maybe there there is is an order. And, and, well, maybe there's not. Um, But yeah, when we consider many different texts, it can be very difficult to decide what order some of these things go in. When you think of something like regeneration, faith, justification, conversion, trust, repentance, being born again, you go, which one kind of goes where? Or is it that they all kind of happen about at the same time or even simultaneously? How does that work? Well, as I'm studying all of this, uh, I I think a a safer route, I will agree with a a brother, uh, theologian Bruce Demarest, who uh, has just a a great book called The Cross and Salvation. And and after evaluating all of these different systems, he, he comes to this conclusion where he groups things into four major groupings. He first has the plan and provision of salvation, right? That's all those things we've been talking about that happened in the eternity past, before the foundation of the world, to to, uh, appropriate our salvation. Then he has the application of salvation, which is more that in the moment, you know, leading right up to it, and of course, at the time of salvation. And and granted, I, I, I understand too that some of you have that very specific day and time where you know, at that moment, I was saved. And others of you have a time period, right, where you go, you know, I don't know about an exact moment, but from this point, you know, I was, I was seeking, I was wondering, I was praying to this point. Now I know I'm saved and it happened somewhere in between, right? And that's, and that's fine too. But that's that process of salvation. Then he has the third category, the progress of application. And what he means by that is really now from the time you're saved until the time that you go to be with the Lord or he returns, whichever comes first, that that is that sanctification progress And then lastly, the perfecting of salvation, meaning glorification, meaning finally living with Jesus Christ in his heavenly kingdom. So that being said, I've kind of shifted from um, the the ordu salutis to what I will offer you, which which is this. This morning we want to examine how in all aspects... In all facets of the salvation process, that God is indeed sovereign. He is sovereign over each and every part of that process. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, And of course, we're going to turn to our, our kind of jumping off text, 2 Thessalonians. Go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians and please stand as we always do for the reading of God's Word. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where we will again read verses 13 to 15. By the, by the end of it, we should all have these verses memorized, right? Maybe that'll be our exam. Our last message here, we, we'll, 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 uh, we'll say it all together. And, uh, oh, I'm committing us to something, huh? Yeah, that's not going to be good when we, <laughs> if we didn't get there. All right, the reading of God's Word. This is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul writes this in verses 13 to 15. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, just to give you the ever so quick review, to bring you up to speed to where we're at, the first week that we had in our sovereignty, uh, salvation and the sovereignty of God study focused on the depravity of man and the fact that all people everywhere throughout all time are sinners. We were born sinners and we choose to sin and because of this we are dead in our sins. And the consequence of our sins against God are of course death in hell. And and this should have left us, well it did leave us with the question, how then can anyone be saved if we are dead and unable to come to God? Well that was the second week then, is the fact that God chooses some for salvation. We call this doctrine election or predestination, foreknowledge. And God wanted it crystal clear that he is the one who saves, not us. We can't save ourselves. That took us to the third week where we asked the question, so why does God choose some and not others? Which <clears throat> led us last week or a couple weeks ago to uh, Romans 9, and Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And the simplest answer there from the text is that it's God's prerogative to save who he will save. We can't say, yeah, but that's not fair. That's not fair. Because in that same text, we find out there is no injustice with God. There is none. No injustice. And frankly, as we've said, you and I, we don't want what's fair. We do not want what's fair. The fourth week, last week, we asked two more questions pertaining to these doctrines of election, predestination, and foreknowledge. If God desires all people to be, to be saved, then how come all people aren't saved? Right? If that's his desire. Well, we learned, well, it's all about his glory, first of all, and how he will get glory and how he will get the most glory. And then we talked about the difference in God's will and, and the fact that he has a desiring will, that which he desires to have happen versus his actual decreeing will that which he absolutely says will take place then we also asked another question how does my free will fit in with God's sovereignty how does it fit in I mean the fact is is God does the work of saving us we respond positively of our own volition and will by seeking coming Calling, inclining, listening, returning, eating, drinking, taking, forsaking, sin, uh, forsaking sin, confessing, repenting, believing, receiving, trusting, and having faith. Those are all those things that we understand that we do of our will. And yet, it's also God, we learned, that gives us the ability to respond in those ways. So yes, God is sovereign even over your free will. Okay, as Jesus said in John 6 and verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him. Your believing in him is his work in you. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, whom he has sent. And we learn that the only way that we can come to him is if he is first drawn us to himself John 6 35 and 44 in fact our coming to Jesus the text there tells us too that has to be granted by the father Jesus gives eternal life to the sheep and then the sheep do what they follow and while going through these passages we also then re- re- saw that there were a couple other doctrines that that come into play. Um, One is called the doctrine of irresistible grace, that you cannot say no to God saving you. You wouldn't want to. And the perseverance of the saints, which in a nutshell is once saved, always saved, that you cannot lose your salvation. Now, what was difficult about all of this is the fact that in Scripture we see both God's sovereignty in our salvation and our free will response. And I know what you're still thinking, some of you, but if God is making me believe and I can't resist him, well, then I don't really have free will. Yeah, not exactly, huh? Not exactly. 
I know these things seem paradoxical. We learned that that means that you have two competing truths, and yet they are exactly what the Scriptures teach. And I would challenge any of you, any of you who know that you are saved, to, to, to speak up and, 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 and tell us that when, when God saved you, that you came to your salvation kicking and screaming. Or that you felt pushed or prodded, you know, the cattle prod or coerced or forced to believe. Of course not. Of course not. You believed. You received. You trusted. You had faith. And you did so of your own will and volition. Remember, paradoxical truths that we hold in tension. All right? Both are true. So let us do this. Let us, let us return to our original text for just a few minutes. This text of 2 Thessalonians. Because I, I want to make sure we keep going back to that text to see the things that we're learning and how they are, they're embedded in that text. Um, I just want to point out to you these doctrines that we've been looking at so far and then kind of set the stage for the rest of our morning. In verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, We've seen quite clearly how it is that God has chosen you from the beginning. From before the foundation of the world, way back in eternity past. And we haven't specifically talked about the sanctification aspect that we see here in the text. We will get to that, um, that we see in verse 13. But we've talked about it extensively other times from the pulpit here and even in in you know the last couple of few months and there is both your sanctification at the time of salvation that you are indeed at that moment sanctified you are set apart for God you are made holy in his sight righteous in his sight but then there's also that aspect of sanctification that's from that moment until right we go to be with the Lord or he returns whichever comes first as we I like to say anyway but that's kind of the sal- uh, sanctification aspect Now, along with God choosing and the Holy Spirit sanctifying, we see in our text that this also came about because of your faith in the truth. In other words, your belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus, that we are sinners and we have a need for a Savior because our sins against God have consequences, namely death, hell, eternity in the lake of fire. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That Jesus indeed went to the cross in our place on on our behalf, taking our sin and our shame upon himself, dying the death that he died, going into the grave, but then three days later resurrecting unto eternal life. And that knowing because he resurrected, we too are promised that same resurrection from the dead. To live with him in his eternal kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever. Then in verse 14 of our text here, Paul reiterates this point reminding that God uses the gospel to call people to salvation. With the point of salvation being that you may gain the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. You too will be glorified. You too will live in his kingdom with him eternally. So, so this week, I, I just think it's uh, only appropriate that we make some further mention of the gospel as we go through this study. And so this morning, we want to consider God's sovereignty in the different aspects of The gospel. In other words, how it's applied to us. How it's appropriated to us. And what might be some of the results. I'm going to freak you out here. You ready? We're going to have 20 points this morning. 20 points. So buckle up. Hope you brought your lunch because it's going to be a while. Probably about 5 o'clock. Maybe we'll let you out for dinner. No, I'm kidding. We'll be done in our normal time. We'll just move kind of quickly. And that's the thing. Th- this is a different kind of message. It's not one where we're getting into one verse or one text in-depthly. I'm, I'm purposefully, intentionally blasting you with the fire hose, the fire hydrant, right? We've got the fire hydrant off, and you're just getting... 
And I'm going to go kind of quick, right? And if you need, you know, if you like to jot down verses or whatever, jot down verses. I'm going to have you turn to some, some. I'm just going to, and, and I, because I want you to just kind of be, I want you to kind of be just bowled over. Bowled over by the fact that God is sovereign in so much of, in all of this, in all of this that we call salvation. All right? First, we'll kind of focus on how it's applied. How it's applied. And the first point is this. God sovereignly forgives your sin. God sovereignly forgives your sin. Acts 10 and verse 43 has Peter preaching to Cornelius and his household. Cornelius was a, a centurion of the Italian cohort. And this was the big moment when God revealed to Peter that the gospel would go out to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And he says this in Acts 10, 43. Of him, meaning Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives, what? Forgiveness of sins. You know, as we go through these two, what will be interesting is you'll be able to see God's sovereignty in all of it. But you'll also see all of those those situations where it's of a person's will and volition, too, that they are that they are responding in this way, right? Because here it's everyone who believes, receives forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness coming, though, from Jesus himself. And why is this so important? Because it's our sins against God that cause us to stand guilty before him with the penalty of death and hell for all eternity. Secondly, God sovereignly atones for your sin. He sovereignly atones for your sin. Now, this is one of the the facets of forgiveness, you might say. Atonement is actually an Old Testament word that means to cover. But it also means to wash away. So to atone for one's sins in the Old Testament required that animal sacrifice. The literal shedding of blood for the covering of sin. In the New Testament, it refers to the fact that Christ's blood through his death, covers our sin before God. It even washes it away, right? It cleanses us. It makes us whiter than snow. Just like the song says, What can wash away my sin? Jesus. There we go. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who could shed his blood on our behalf because only Jesus is the spotless lamb of God that once for all perfect sacrifice that could appease God's wrath against us now some people like to argue oh I'm sorry I mean discuss they like to discuss who the atonement is for in other words who did Jesus die for did he die for the whole world or did he die, you know, like all people everywhere throughout time? Or, or did he die for a specific group of people, namely the elect? Well, here's the thing. We have scriptures like John 10 and verse 15, where Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's very specific. He's not talking about goats. He's talking about sheep, the elect. That's who the sheep are. Those who believe in him. So you look at a text like that and it would seem then that Jesus didn't die for every last person on earth. But rather those chosen by the Father for salvation. The elect. Then you go to a text like Hebrews 2 verse 9. Which tells us that Jesus was made as a human being. Quote, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. End quote. Huh. So which is it? Did he die for everyone? Or did he just die for the elect? Yes. Tension. Tension that we have to hold, friends. Okay? I'll let you battle that out in your fellowship groups. How about that? Some people like to say this. Well, we understand that his death would be sufficient for as many people as would come to him, right? That, that if there were a billion more people that came to faith in Christ, his death would be sufficient. Two billion, yep. Three billion, four billion, whatever. Yes, 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 yes. His death certainly could be sufficient for any and every human 
being. But some then would like to would say that, but it is effectual for the elect. It actually comes to, to, uh, to be for the elect. Again, you can battle that out another time. We see texts uh, pertaining to the atonement in Ephesians 5, 2, where it tells us that Christ gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, right? And in 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit or revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 which says to him who loves us and washed us from our sins by his blood in uh, stroudsburg pennsylvania there's a grave of a civil war soldier and the stone bears the date of his birth and death and then these words abraham lincoln's substitute in the woe and anguish of the war Realizing that thousands upon thousands were falling in his place on the field of battle, Lincoln chose to honor one particular soldier as his substitute and make him a a symbol, as it were, of the fact that the soldiers who perished in battle were dying that others might live. Substitute. Now, the next four points that we have more or less explain the atonement. Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 5. Some of these will take a little bit more time, and others we're going to go kind of lickety-split through, but this is Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, 8 to 10. And the point is this. Number three, God sovereignly justifies you. He sovereignly justifies you. Now, justification is a legal term, meaning your slate of offenses has been wiped clean by God through the death of His Son. Many of you have... Read in Romans 3 how we are justified by our faith, but the scriptures also teach our justification as sovereignly coming from God. Romans 5, verses 8 to 10, read this. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And there's that phrase justified by whose blood? Not your blood, not my blood, his blood, Jesus' blood. Fourthly, uh, Jesus sovereignly makes propitiation for you. He sovereignly makes propitiation for you. This is from Hebrews 2. Uh, 17 in Hebrews 2 17 the author of Hebrews writes therefore he Jesus had to be made like his brethren in all things that means made like us in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. Now, propitiation is mentioned four times in the scriptures. It's one of those big, you know, five dollar theology words that means to appease or satisfy. And in the context of how it's used in scripture, it means to appease or satisfy a holy, righteous God who demands justice for his for our sins against him. Romans 3 and verse 25 tells us that this propitiation was in Jesus' blood. And in 1 John 4.10, tells us that Jesus became our propitiation, not because of our love for God, but rather his love for us. Fifthly, God sovereignly redeems you. He sovereignly redeems you. In Psalm 103, verse 4, it says that God redeems your life from the pit. The pit. To redeem something, it means to ransom something or to to buy something back. I mean, just like, you know, in the cop shows or whatever. When, you know, we think of a kidnapper asking for ransom they're holding a person hostage until they get paid a certain amount of money and then they're released 
Mark 10 and verse 45. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan the Lion ransoms his life to the White Witch in order to release young Edmund Pevensey from her power. In our case, we are held captive by our sin, and Jesus pays our ransom to release us from our sin and the clutches of Satan with his blood. Colossians 3, or chapter 1, verses 13 to 14 tells us that in Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in Revelation 5, 9 tells us that Jesus purchased for God with his blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Number six, God sovereignly reconciles you to him. He reconciles you to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 19, Paul has been explaining different aspects of the gospel when he says this, quote, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. In Romans 5, 11, Paul says that we have received the reconciliation. And in the Greek, this Word, reconciliation, has a, in a very intensive form, meaning to change. And the, the change in this case is from being enemies of God to, to, well, because of the demands of God's justice, to being friends with God. Friends with God, which can only come about by the aversion of His wrath which we'll see more in our next couple of points. And then verse 19 there explains, it is not counting their trespasses against them. It's not having our trespasses counted or held against us. There's that classic text in Isaiah 55, 7, which says the wicked and the righteous are told to return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon we're to return and be reconciled back with God. Seven, God sovereignly regenerates you. He sovereignly regenerates you. We could turn to, to Titus, uh, the book of Titus in chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, of course, Paul writing to Titus. And he says this, chapter 3 and verse 5. He, meaning Jesus, saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Paul says that we are a new creature in Christ Jesus with the old things having passed away, but the new things have come and remember, God told Nicodemus that he had to be what? Born again. Born again. And, and John says that the children of God are those born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is God giving new life to our souls that were previously dead because of our trespasses and sins. Now as we continue on, let, let us kind of switch gears a little bit and consider how the, this gospel is appropriated. How does it sovereignly come to you? It's kind of like we're, we're backtracking here for a minute. We saw all these things that happen kind of at the time of salvation. And, and what kind of leads us to that point? Well, number eight is that God sovereignly gifts you his grace. Now, some of these we've already talked about, so we won't kind of belabor uh, these points, but we, we already read previously in another message, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. A lot of you know that passage, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Oh, wait a minute. That's what I exercise, right? Faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. And, and I mentioned, I think it was last week or maybe the week before, in this context, the Greek grammar is such that both the grace and the faith are gifts of God. You say, but that's my free will volition, right? Yes, but it's a gift of God. He gave that to you. He gave you that ability. 
We'll get to faith as a separate point. We'll just focus on grace for another minute. By its context, grace is a gift. A gift of God. A gift that you did not earn because God knows if he allowed you or I to earn it, then guess what? It wouldn't be grace, and we'd take all the credit. Happily, we'd become boastful. Now, by definition, grace is something which causes joy or pleasure or gratification, favor or acceptance for a kindness, something that's been granted to you. It is a favor done without expectation of return. It is absolutely a free expression of the loving kindness of God to men, finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver, God. And as I've often said, it's, it's an unearned, it's unmerited favor. And remember that as totally depraved human beings with no godly righteousness inside us at all, we are completely then dependent on the grace of God. Which started, by the way, in eternity past when he predestined and elected you to salvation. Number nine. God sovereignly draws you to himself. He sovereignly draws you to himself. Now, we talked about this last week as well when we looked at John chapter 6 and verse 39, where Jesus, in reference to salvation, said this, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. There's that irresistible grace, right? All that the Father gives me, Jesus is speaking shall come to me. If you've been given by the Father, guess what? You're coming to Jesus. You're coming to Jesus. Then in verse 39, he says, this is the will of him who sent me. Of course, this is Jesus talking. This is the will of him who sent me, meaning the Father, that of all that he has given me, I lose one, two, three, none, None, right? Nothing. I lose nothing. There's that doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, right? Once saved, always saved. I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Then verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me, here's that word, draws him. We can't come to Jesus, or excuse me, we can't come to the Father unless we are drawn by him. And he says, I, Jesus, will raise him up on the last day. Then in verse 65, he says, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. We have to be drawn, and it has to have been granted us. The drawn is that idea of pulling something to you, even fishermen drawing up their nets. And if you remember in the, the, the last chapter of John, that they drew up the fish, 153, by the way, Right? Or it's how a mother or a father takes their child and draws that child to their breast. So God draws us in a compelling, irresistible way. Number 10, God sovereignly illuminates your mind. He sovereignly illuminates your mind. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians just back up a little bit there if you were in Titus. 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, right at the beginning. Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. To illuminate simply means to brighten with light. To brighten with light. In an intellectual or spiritual context, it means to enlighten by getting knowledge or understanding. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12... It says, oh, excuse me, hold on. We're, we're going to read that in just a sec. We're going to read that. So just get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. And, and before I read that, I'm going to just read you a couple others. Luke eleven thirty six. 36, Jesus says, If therefore your whole body is full of light, with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines with its rays. Or in Luke 10, verses 21 to 22, Jesus praises his Father for the revealing of the gospel to his children, his elect, when he says this in verse 22, No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. That's also part of that 
illumination. And in Matthew 13 and verse 11, Jesus said to the disciples, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries. There's that illumination of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. They are not being illumined, those that do not come to Christ. So how does God illuminate but through the Holy Spirit? Here's our text of 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. There it is. That's the illumination aspect, that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And then down in verse 14, it says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand So that natural man, that one that does not come to faith, that does not know the Lord, right? He even can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. So in a sense, then, the the Holy Spirit is acting like a, a translator, illuminating someone's mind so they can spiritually understand. When I went with a, a couple of short-term missions trips um, from Calvary Bible Church to Russia, we had translators, and that's what the translator does, and that's kind of an interesting thing if you've never done that, had somebody translate for you, um, you know, and you're sharing Christ and sharing the gospel, but that's what they're doing. They're helping to illuminate what I'm trying to tell them, right, to make it understandable to those that would hear. Now, in order for someone to have a true saving understanding of the gospel, the Holy Spirit must illuminate, enlighten, and make clear the word of God to them. Number 11, God sovereignly opens your heart. Acts 16 and verse 14, this is Paul's second missionary journey. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The things of the gospel. So the Lord opened her heart so she could understand. In a spiritual sense, this also means that he made her willing and able to understand the spiritual truths that Paul was explaining about the gospel, which she then responded to with saving faith. Number 12, God sovereignly opens your mind. Not only does he open your heart, but he opens your mind. You can turn to Luke 24, if you like. Luke 24, beginning in verse 44. After Jesus had resurrected, he appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem by suddenly standing in their midst, appearing to them in a room that was locked from the inside. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Until Jesus proved to them that he was very real and in the flesh, albeit glorified flesh. And it says this in Luke 24, verse 44. Now he said to them, meaning Jesus, to the disciples, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is what God does for us. We hear the gospel. Our minds are opened to understand the scriptures. Number 13, God sovereignly grants you belief. He sovereignly grants you belief. We talked about this granting last week, this granting of God. In Philippians 1 and verse 29, Paul writes, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So that it's that granting of belief. Even in our response of believing in Jesus, in his gospel message, this is still all under the sovereign control of God. In other words, the only reason that that you could believe was because God granted you that ability. You go, but there's that puppet thing again. That is the marionette, and I'm just being controlled. And yes, yes, and aren't you thankful that he did grant you belief and that he continues to have control over your life and decisions? 
That's an amen for me. 14, God sovereignly gifts you faith. There's that faith to go back with the grace. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So yeah, even the faith is not of yourself. Yes, it is your free will response, but it's also not of yourself. Grace, salvation by grace through faith. In other words, faith along with grace is that gift of God. It is not something we can accomplish ourselves. And you go, oh, wait a minute. Does this also mean that God is controlling my free will decision to exercise faith? You better believe it and praise him for it. Next, 15, God sovereignly grants you repentance. You can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 if you like. God sovereignly grants you repentance. 2 Timothy 2 Beginning in verse 24. That's why there's no 24s. I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2. 24 to 26. And the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Wait a minute, didn't didn't Jesus say, repent and believe in the gospel? Like, that's on me, right? Well, yeah, except here is that God, if that is the case, grants you that repentance. It's still under God's sovereign control. Because we have to have God granting us repentance, because all we could do is the will of the devil, who we've been held captive by and being dead in our sins. This is to say he gives us the ability to recognize our own sinful predicament of opposing God. Being hateful to God. Being rebellious to God. And then to turn. Turn toward the knowledge of the truth. That is the gospel. Again, even even, uh, going back to Isaiah 55. Let him return to the Lord. Do that 180. And then for our last section of of, um, points, let us see some of the results of God's sovereignty in your salvation. We've had some of the application and the appropriation and now some of the results. God sovereignly gives you his Holy Spirit. That's number 16. He sovereignly gives you his Holy Spirit. In John 14, verses 16 to 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And you go, wait a minute, that sounds like that's one of those promises that was specifically for the disciples. Well, yes, but there is also one of those that can translate to us as well. But thankfully, we have Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who has given us a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. 17. God sovereignly unites you to himself. He sovereignly unites you to himself. In Ephesians again, chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, even when we were dead in our transgressions, Made us alive together. God the Father made us alive together with Christ. You're united with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You go, well, I'm, no, I'm sitting here in the pew. I'm not sitting there. No, there's that sense that you are. <laughs> That's your place reserved for you done deal, promise. In 1 John 4 and verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We are united sovereignly by God with him. God sovereignly also adopts you 
This one has a, a special place in the heart of the, the Underwoods. In Ephesians 1 and verse 5, it says that, that he predestined us. God the Father predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Or in John 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become what? Children of God. And yes, Adoption is a wonderful thing that God would adopt us. You know, he didn't look down there and go, oh man, uh, let's see, uh, no, forget him, forget him. Uh, you know. No, we, right, even while we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for us and then certainly adopted us. God sovereignly sanctifies you. Number 18, he sovereignly sanctifies, number 19, sorry, Sovereignly sanctifies you. To sanctify again, to make, to make clean, pure, holy, set apart. Uh, we, we have a, uh, I was telling my wife, you know, we're, we're in the process of selling our house and hopefully buying something a little bit closer to uh, Calvary here. And oh man, one of the things our house now has is, uh, has that whole cool water filter system, you know. And you, you taste the difference, right, from that clean, pure water versus the stuff that just comes out of the tap. So we got to get one of those in the whatever new house we get, you know. But um, yeah, it's, it's that idea of holy, pure, set apart. We are first sanctified at salvation. We already talked about that. Hebrews 10 and verse 10 says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So when he died for us, right, and then we became a believer, of course, then we are in one sense sanctified. And then in verse 14 of Hebrews 10, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And that speaking, of course, to also what we will have in the future. In this sense, you were sanctified the moment that God saved you. And in addition, you now begin this process of sanctification that God will do in you until it's completed at the return of his son. Number 20. Number 20. God sovereignly gives you eternal life. He sovereignly gives you eternal life. In John chapter 10, verses 27 to 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There's that irresistible grace again. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. There's that perseverance of the saints, right? And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Or Acts 13 and verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed for eternal life, believed. They were appointed for eternal life. You and I. And again, a good example of election. And Romans 6 and verses 22 to 23. Where Paul says, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's an oft-told story, but its moral points up a great truth. There was an extremely wealthy man who possessed vast treasures of art. The man who had one son, the man had one son who was frankly an ordinary boy and who passed away late in adolescence. Having loved the lad deeply, the sorrowing father died of a broken heart only a few weeks later. The father's will provided that everything would be sold by auction. And strangely, the father stipulated that an oil painting of his son was to be the first item offered by the auctioneer. Well, large crowds came to bid on the widely reputed collection of art. And in keeping with the proviso of the will, the boy's portrait was first held up for bids. No one cared about the deceased boy. They cared about the art. Not until several moments had passed did an old previous servant of the family 
a man who had always loved the boy, placed a 75-cent bid on this picture. The picture was at once sold to the former servant, there being no further bids registered. Then the dramatic moment came. The sale was stopped, as the will had further provided that anyone who loved the son enough to buy his portrait should receive everything in the father's house. I just think what a great picture of the, of the gospel, huh? And, and if we would come to the son, we would come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, that we would, by God, be drawn to him and come to him that we would believe that we would receive him that we would be granted that grace and faith to believe in the son then of course through his spirit he continues to take care of us in this earthly life until we are blessed with eternity in his kingdom Friends, as we've said many times, this is the sovereignty of God in your salvation. Yes, you have been elected and predestined before the foundation of the world to believe, but here's the thing, we don't know who those people are. So all the more reason to be fired up for the Lord, fired up for evangelism, fired up to share Christ with any and all that you, your path might meet. As you go outside these doors. Let's pray. Father we thank you Lord for these tremendous truths that you are indeed sovereign. And even in those times Lord where we are called by you to respond with repentance and confession and and faith. And to come and to call Father and to believe it's still under your sovereign hand. We don't always understand how these things work but Lord, we trust in your holy scripture that they do. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.